Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. You're tuned into the Geneva Business Insider, that monthly series where we talk to David L. Smith, located there in Geneva, Switzerland, about everything going on in the world, geopolitical, economic, social, and otherwise. David L. Smith, always a fount of knowledge. Uh, it's great to have you back on the program. Thanks for joining us again. As always, it's good to be here, James. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Well, let's get straight into it today with uh, the latest post on GenevaBusinessInsider.blogspot.com. Absolutely uh, fascinating. You're starting your own interview series, and you started with a very interesting topic and one that uh, I've talked about on the Corbett Report before, but you get into some uh, degree of detail about it. You're talking about education with John Hancock. First, uh, tell us a little bit about your new interview series and what you're planning to do, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the interview that you just conducted. Okay, well, thank you. Well, you know, James, I've always been in admiration of people such as yourself who actually had taken the big plunge and said, okay, well, I'm going to start doing interviewing and communicating because uh, it, it opens up another di dimension. And uh, one, of course, comes across uh, interesting people and one can have an exchange of ideas on, on subjects which are perhaps uh, entirely different. For example, the, to my, the first interview I did was with a, a friend who's based in Geneva, who's a distinguished economist working for the World Trade Organization. And in addition to that, uh, we happen to have children of approximately the same age, which is um, moving on to university. So we decided, uh, having flogged to death the subjects of what Mr. Yellen, Mrs. Yellen was going to do or Mr. Bernanke was going to do, that perhaps we should talk about something that was a little bit real life, and also to display that there was uh, more more breadth to my thinking than uniquely straight up and down economics, politics, finance, and geopolitical issues. So that was really the the, the start of the idea, and uh, I, I plan to perhaps uh, try and emulate uh, the style you have with James Evan Palato, which I find very refreshing, and uh, where you've got a uh, batting the ball back and forward between you on, on, on chosen subjects, which I think is a very nice formula. And I'd be very happy if sometimes you want to post some of my stuff as well. Absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, my hat's off to you for getting in the ring and starting uh, to do this. I know it's never easy to start out and there's a million headaches and worries and things that uh, that come with it, but it's absolutely important and something that I hope my work will in some way inspire some people to do. And if it inspires even one person to get uh, into this uh, into this ring and start the, the fight, then I'm absolutely uh, just uh, overwhelmed with that. So so thank you so much for, for, uh, for starting this series. I'm going to be looking forward to it. It's up on your YouTube. YouTube channel, but uh, the pr probably the easiest way to find it is from GenevaBusinessInsider.blogspot.com, and people can find episode number one with John Hancock, but you realize that a lot of people have probably already busted out the big thumbs down um, just listening to you talk about having a friend in the WTO. Uh, what What's going on here? You guys must be talking about uh, worshipping at the corporate altar, altar or something like that, right? Well, I mean, uh, even more than being a friend, he's even Canadian, which is uh, even more alarming. <laughs> but um, no, I, I think you, you, you find people who are within the system and uh, obviously the pro professional views and the private views, uh, the two can be, be separate. Um, and, and obviously I would not embarrass him by <clears throat> put, picking topics which, which would cause him a conflict in his day-to-day -day, um, professional work any more than I would with, it, with anybody else. But... Um, you know, Geneva is a funny town like that. It's a very big melting pot. You've got all of the international organizations here, all, all very, very many of the major multinational corporations, lots of banks and so on. So there, there's, a, there's a, a pool of, um, you know, talented people who are doing very, very, very different things, all, all in the same town, which has got maybe, you know, 200,000 uh, population. So it, it's... Um, it's a good fishing ground for interesting people to interview, and uh, I look forward to doing that. But um, I, I, I do feel that these things tend to feed off themselves. I mean, as, as, as you and I know, I mean, we first came in, in, in contact uh, through the fact that we knew Bob Chapman in common, uh, a guy who I greatly admired. And, and uh, in fact, uh, when he passed away, it, it, it led to our making contact and, and you, know, you know, planting two small trees to replace a giant oak that disappeared from the landscape. So um, I, I do it for that reason, and I, I, I also do it for, um, you know, for my own mental stimulation, because they, 
if you look at the um, mainstream media, there is no interest to go there anymore. If you look at the alternative media, and uh, you see people on that, there, there are fascinating people all over the world, and, and, and you interview many of them, that, you know, but there may be 20 other people who do the same kind of thing, with the same kind of philosophy, and there's a pool of people in where um, I would like to bring some of these ideas to, to, to the table through doing it myself and uh, perhaps benefit other people by doing that. And as I say, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's exactly an ego trip, but it is, a, it is uh, intellectually satisfying to have the pleasure of speaking to, some, to a wide range of people who actually know what they're talking about and, and who are not afraid to tell the truth about things and, and uh, see with clarity through the, the, the fogs of deception that are created by the mainstream media, the politicians, the bankers, the central bankers, etc. That was one of the great joys of starting my own website and starting to do this, actually, is that I got an excuse to email up some of these people that I've been listening to and say, hey, you want to want to chat? <laughs> oh, I've got, a, I've got a website. We can do an interview. And, uh, and a lot of people will do that. Yeah, it's a great way to, to get to uh, to pick the brains of some of the brightest people on the planet. So so absolutely. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about education, since this was the topic of your uh, conversation. And I don't want to step on the toes of that conversation, so we won't uh, tread into it uh, too much or rehash any of the territory that you covered. But uh, personally, I don't know anything about your educational background. What about David L. Smith? What degrees and credentials and letters do you have behind your name? Ah, okay. You want to know where I was dragged up? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I started off uh, in, in, in Scotland. I did a law degree. Um, I decided that a law degree in Scotland was a bit limiting, so I decided then to train as a chartered accountant. So I've got uh, you know three seven seven years of post school education in terms of uh, professional qualifications and then thereafter I, I got into the great big school of life where I continue to learn more every day and um, I'm never surprised at being surprised as as one of my friends says so um, I, I'm trying to re reflect on my my education and be aware of how little I knew coming from, uh, you know, a sort of bourgeois town and I, I guess a kind of a bourgeois family from Scotland and walking into London at the age of 23 thinking, well, you know, here I am, the world should be at my, my feet because I'm such a smart chap. And boy, oh boy, did I have a rude awakening, which is still not ceased today. So um, watching my own daughter, in fact, uh, she's had a great week because she's had about four accept provisional acceptances from universities that she's applied for. So she's over the moon and um, thinking now that uh, she, she's really on the way, whereas, as you and I know, she's, <clears throat> she's getting close to the beginning, but nowhere, nowhere near to the beginning of the end, even, or not even the end of the beginning. Uh, but it's very gratifying to watch your children go through that phase. And, uh, but I, I think the, uh, um, the, the, the thing that is uh, <coughs> interesting is to realize how different education is now from when I was there. Uh, I read a very interesting book by Charles Hugh Smith recently. I recommend anyone to take, take a look at it on, on exactly this topic. And much of what he, he says I, I agree with. You know, you, you have such an imbalance between the number of students who are being produced compared to the actual needs at the under, other end of the pipeline that one has to wonder why in America uh, the government has decided to allow student debt to build up to levels of, uh, you know, approximately a trillion dollars in order to educate people to do something that uh, no one wants them to do. So I tried to explain to my, my own children uh, that paper qualifications, while Almost, you know, while a guarantee of employment, at least in the early stages of my life, is no longer a guarantee, and that they really have to work on, on what they are, who they are, and um, you know, look look at the question of uh, is what I am doing actually adding value to an employer who can take me on board next week, and that can be useful. Am I am I adaptable? Can I work with multicultural situations? Can I work cross border? Uh, Am I a good team player? Um, do I take initiatives? And most of all, can I think, can I just be sim very simply relied upon? And I don't think any of these things were taught at university. I, I mean, I have to say I missed more lectures by going out partying at night than I'd, I'd like to think about, <clears throat> and somehow got away with it, you know. 
But um, that's a question of, are you reliable? You know, is your employer going to say, he's going to be here at 8 o'clock in the morning, fresh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and be off to, be, be off to work at, uh, at 8.30 after his cup of coffee? So these are all things which are, are, are more important than having a 2-1. And the other dynamic of the situation, of course, even if you have a 2-1, there's a, there's a pile of un unemployed people who've got PhDs who are from the year before who are waiting to find a job themselves. So it's really a, it's a challenge, and uh, it's, a, it's a challenge that's not going to go away. And I, and I, I just try to enforce them on, in the mentality of my kids the, those, those vital qualities uh, that uh, are necessary in order to succeed with or without a university degree. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you raise, I think, what is really the heart of the matter. You raise the uh, the almost trillion dollar debt bubble, a uh, student debt bubble that now exists in uh, in the United States. And I think that it is absolutely a bubble. We talk about economic bub bubbles all the time, but I think that the student debt bubble is also a bubble because it is also similarly based on a product that the, the demand is way in ex ex excess of where it should be. Um, exactly as you indicate, there are way, there's a glut, way too many students that are being produced for the number of positions uh, which could be reasonably filled with those students. And it has become a standard um, for no real a good reason other than to basically feed the university uh, industrial complex, which I know you talk about in your conversation with John Hancock. So I think that that is really the heart of the matter. And I now as a father myself, I I wouldn't advise my son in at, 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 at to go into university unless he was going into some trade that actually required some sort of sort of, sort of specialized training. But I I look back at my own university uh, experience as basically a waste of time, and uh, and I really do regret the the all the years that I wasn't spending doing actual work like the, on the the website uh, it, that I was spent in classrooms learning things that I could have been learning by myself. And I think that to to my mind. And that's the real difference between uh, the generation that's growing up today and and previous generations is that uh, self self learning has never been easier than it is right now with uh, all of this information available at your fingertips basically um, for you to to find for yourself. So I I just don't see the point in post secondary education for ninety nine percent of positions at this point. Well, that's right. And the other thing, I think it's been done quite cynically, because if you look at America, for example, you look at the combined effect of what the Fed is doing with 0% uh, interest rates and student debt. And 0% interest rates means that parents who probably had some investment income that they could have given over to their, their kids to, to study now receive no money at all. So they may well end up on, on, on food stamps. And then, of course, their children get, become debt slaves. So, so you, you, it, it's a double whammy to put people onto the government's uh, payroll and dependency. And if you get in, into debt as a student debt, there is no way even by, if I believe, even if you go bankrupt, you cannot ultimately escape this debt. So it is educational slavery and it is feeding the educational industrial complex with complete cynicism. And you look at the people at the top end of that chain and you go all the way up to Mr. Larry Summers, for example, as the, as the head of the University of Harvard. Um, uh, you know, the, the, these low-level students are, are feeding a very heavy food chain, and they're also feeding you know, people who are doing research, people who are taking huge salaries and, and uh, working at the same time for think tanks, etc. The whole thing is, like everything else in America these days, just... Uh, totally corrupted by capitalistic interests of, of, of the elites. It absolutely is. And again, as you point out, this is a system that's been designed this way. We've talked about this on the podcast uh, in the past, so I hope people will look into that. But I was recently talking about how Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family and the Rockefeller Foundation, in conjunction with the Carnegies, worked uh, concertedly at the dawn of the 20th century to basically take over the medical profession. And that is absolutely equally true of education. And uh, people should look into the history of the General Education Board as just one example of that. So I think that we have to understand this is part of a very concerted and long-range plan that has been in place for generations now to basically create the society that we have now. So when people talk about the education system is in collapse and in ruin, we should just throw more money at the problem. <laughs> I think they, ha they don't really understand what the problem is. But again, you have uh, a, a quite an interesting conversation with John Hancock uh, along these, uh, these lines, so I'll let people 
take a look at that on your website. Why don't we change gears, if you're okay with that? Why don't we change gears uh, to something completely different? I wanted to bring up something that I thought was an exceptionally important story and one that hasn't really gained a lot of attention, even on the alternative media. And that's uh, a story that was on oilprice.com recently. Uh, China is now the world's largest importer of oil what next? And basically this article goes through the fact that uh, China has just surpassed the United States as the world's single largest importer of oil with 6.3 million barrels per day flowing into China, which uh, puts it just over the US's 6.24 million, just another economic indicator that China is set to become the world's largest economy in a year now. So uh, this is, I think this is exceptionally important geopolitically and potentially um, financially as well. Um, Why don't we talk a little bit about this and what you see as the implications and ramifications of this change. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very very interesting to, to realize these things kind of creep up on you. I mean, 20 years ago, they were negligible, and now, now they're competing with the U.S. Now, I mean, you can maybe say in the U.S. at the moment that they, uh, the, the U.S. is producing much more oil, so they need to import less, I mean, which is a factor. Uh, but they all, the, the U.S. is also helping to reduce their own oil consumption by offshoring all industrial activities to countries like China or creating so many unemployed people that no one can afford to drive a car anymore, and so they just sit at home. And uh, then on, on, on the other side, of course, uh, you have the, the, the Chinese situation where you have an emerging middle class where more and more people are wanting to get cars. and. They're all jamming onto the same roads and creating massive pollution problems. Uh, but, but um, you know, the, the, the end result, I'm pretty sure, is, is that this, this gap is going to get wider and wider. And, of course, then the question really comes down to, you know, the geopolitical question comes down to is, where is this oil going to come from? Who is going to supply China? Who is going to supply the U.S.? And, of course, the U.S. has had its hands firmly around the neck of uh, of. Uh, Saudi Arabia in particular, ever since the days of the, the petrodollar, where basically there was a deal, there was a, basically a protection racket that you would have in a mafia gang, which basically says, you know, you, you buy, you know, we'll buy your oil, you pay in dollars, we'll print the dollars for nothing, and uh, if anyone comes and tries to attack you, well, of course, we've got the military bases to protect you. Literally, a, a global um, protection racket. <coughs> now, where then does uh, you know where then does China get its oil oil from? Uh, you know it's getting it from countries like Iran, amongst others. So hence you you find yourself very rapidly coming back to the axis of Iran and Syria and all the things that have been talked about on on many occasions, where where there is a, there's an alignment of interest, which is getting ever stronger be, between the the Asiatic countries and Russia and uh, certain countries in the Middle East who, as far as the Americans are concerned, because they don't play ball and don't want to accept the, the American protection racket, um, are so, suddenly become hostile countries with terrorists everywhere, etc., etc. I'm not saying that Iran are a, a bunch of choir boys, not by any means at all, but um, the, these are the underlying interests. And, and then you come to the, the, the next issue, which, which is, you know, what about the currency? Because at the moment, uh, all oil transactions or virtually all oil transactions are being done in dollars, which maintains a demand for the dollar, which maintains a stronger exchange rate than would exist and if that were suddenly withdrawn. <clears throat> so, so then you start looking at China and saying, well, could they actually start trading di- directly with, uh, you know, with Russia for gas if that's what they want to do or, or with Iran uh, in, in, in the Middle East for oil, et cetera, et cetera, and start doing this in, in, in different currencies uh, altogether? And, and, and the answer is yes, they can. And unlike Libya, who gets rubbed out uh, because they wanted to um, <coughs> move away from the, from the dollar or Saddam Hussein who did the same thing and got rubbed out uh, while America was bringing freedom to and democracy to these countries at the point of a gun, uh, I don't think they can dare play that game with China. <clears throat> and again, we come back to the, the, the very significant developments around Syria, where, where China and Russia saw a very strong joint interest in telling America that's enough. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Obama's... Well, you know, we... 
you know, we, we want to bring freedom to these countries, and Putin didn't quite laugh in his face, but just treated them with, with uh, outright contempt, which uh, tragically, from my point of view, it's what the American president of today actually deserves. So it, it, it's, a very, it's a very big game. Um, the stakes are enormous. The amounts of money are enormous. <clears throat> and then we have to look even at the military aspects and say, all right, well, how, how is it that America is actually holding on to their power at the moment? And uh, there, there are basically two components to, pa to power. What, one is the dollar and, and the other is the military. And the dollar is no longer backed by anything, so it, 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 is, it is no longer a powerful currency unless people accept it. So you, you come down to the fact that, you know, since 1971 when the gold standard ceased and, and money is just printed digitally, uh, American power has basically uh, been at the point of a gun. It's based on, on the military force around the world and nowhere are they more present, omnipresent, than, than in the Gulf areas, you know, with about, I think, about 30 bases. And if you were sitting as Iran looking out, out of your front window and seeing an American aircraft carrier going up and down and imagining there must be <clears throat> a few submarines to back that up, not to mention you know, the, the other 20 ships that surround every aircraft carrier, you would not be feeling very comfortable and you wouldn't want them there and you'd want to be able to defend yourself. So all of the things that are happening, as I've said before, are a direct result of American um, uh, aggressive American foreign policy. Not to protect their interests, but to to uh, uh, attempt to maintain their hegemony in a context of, of declining influence in the world and declining economic importance in the world, etc. And where this will end, I don't know. I, I, you know heaven forbid that it gets into a, a shooting war between some, someone like China and Russia and, and America. But I suspect um, those, that possibility was on the table a few weeks ago in Syria and uh, everybody backed away from it. And uh, Mr. Kerry's idiotic behavior <laughs> about trying to present a solution was, was jumped upon by everybody as the, the most idiotic idea wins because it solves the problem that we, are, we don't want to go forward, we don't want to go backward, so let's, let's grab this uh, straw like a drowning man and get the hell out of here. Right. Well, uh, you you cover that very well. I think you hit on all the important parts there, and I agree completely with with that assessment. I think that this is the start of that kind of tidal shift in in geopolitical relations, and I think it's unfair to say that the dollar isn't backed up by anything. I think you're right. It's backed up basically by U.S. military might and guaranteed by the chattel certain tax slavery of the uh, American um, plantation uh, serfs on the American plantation. So, um, so it is uh, it is an untenable system, an unsustainable system. It's a system that is going to collapse at some point, but it's a question of how we get from here to that collapse. And I think it is a pretty messy road and we're perhaps even starting to see the beginnings of it. It's a point that George Washington's blog made, and I, I echoed in my recent International Forecaster editorial, that uh, the, the recent signs of Saudi Arabia starting to openly back away from the United States as its longtime staunch ally going back to the 1940s and of course, exceptionally close relations since the, uh, the petrodollar of the 1970s, um, we're starting to see that them actively backing away with it, with uh, Saudi uh, intelligence chief Prince Bandar coming out and actively uh, basically condemning the U.S. for not bombing the smithereens out of Syria and Iran like they want them to. So I think that it's interesting to see that in relation to this uh, Chinese oil uh, story, because it perhaps shows that uh, the Saudis know what side of the, the bread their their bread is buttered on. Um, in in the future, if, if the U.S. is declining in terms of its oil imports and China is rising and in fact expected to reach 70% of total world demand by 2020, that's the projections, um, perhaps Saudi Arabia is just uh, basically counting uh, the marbles on each pocket and, and deciding there's more in the Chinese pocket than there is in the U.S. pocket. I don't know if it's as simple as that, but that could at least be one thing that's factoring into what Saudi Arabia is doing at the moment, couldn't it? I think that is exactly right. I mean, if, if, if you're seeing that uh, you're going to have your biggest customer is going to change and be somebody else, then uh, obviously you pay attention to that. And uh, in Switzerland, they have a very nice saying which says you can't have the the butter, the money for the butter, and the milk made at the same time. And this is a principle in which America has, has worked for years now. And it's an arrogance and a blindness to the fact that uh, 
you know, you can't throw your weight around indefinitely and expect, um, expect no one to hit back. I mean, other countries can hit back. I mean, Saudi Arabia is in a very powerful position to do it. And America is not the only game in town. It used to be. Um, and, of course, they, they still have their, their acolytes. And, but it will take a very long time to change. And, and um, you know, Saudi Arabia is still pretty much wedded, you know, joined at the hip to America, whether they, they like it or not. I mean, they, they can distance themselves, but uh, it's a bit like trying to get divorced. It's a very expensive, painful process before it's over. And you're not sure that what you're going to get after is so much better. But uh, I, I do believe that, that, uh, that American um, arrogance uh, it is uh, increasingly becoming their undoing, and it, it's very clear that most of the most of the problems around the world in terms of terrorist counterattacks it's always called terrorist attacks, but in reality it's counterattacks to existing terrorism created by Americans. And if you take the drone strikes in Pakistan, if you're a Pakistani citizen taking your children to school in the morning, you have absolutely no idea whether you or or your are going to get there and whether your children are going to come home in the evening. Now, I suspect that that would build up a certain re level of resentment and hatred in, in anybody who was subject to that kind of thing that far outweighs the advantages of, you know, killing off somebody <clears throat> like, a, you know, like a Taliban leader is going to be replaced the following day by someone who is equally mad and murderous, etc. So the whole, the whole thing, uh, America needs to look at itself. Um, but not the American people. I think the American people are fine, but the American leadership needs to be changed. And, and America has become like, uh, you know, everyone talks about a gun, for example. You know, a gun is not dangerous. It's a person who has the gun that's dangerous. And it's exactly the same thing with America. America is not dangerous. I spent a great deal of time in my life there, love the place and love the people. But unfortunately, the gun, which is America and it's... Um, and its military capacities and its diplomatic uh, strategies it, it are at the moment in the hands of people who I think are completely mad and with an agenda that's completely unrelated to that of the American people. So that has to change and uh, that may need a revolution of some kind, but uh, sitting here in Switzerland I can only observe on it. I don't have an American passport and I'm not in a, in a position to do anything more than say for heaven's sake stop this before it's too late. Well, I think that's the key part of the analysis, because we have to take it to that higher level where um, I think the people who are in the puppeteering this, the, the government actions that we're seeing right now are fully aware of what they're doing. These are not stupid people we're talking about. These are people who understand that they're undermining American interests at the point, but at, at, at a certain point. But they don't care because I think that their their interests are different from America's interests, generally speaking. And I think we are bl blinkered by our nationalist uh, indoctrination that we've had since we were children, believing that because we're the same nationality as a, a Rockefeller or a Rothschild or a who have you, um, that they actually care about us. I, I think that's uh, that's our fundamental flaw for a lot of us with uh, with our inability to see through that thinking and realize that there's an oligarchy that is has much more in common with each other internationally than they do with us, uh, even if we're their countrymen. Um, but that's a lot to bite off and chew. I think we should get to one other point that I wanted to bring up, and uh, along the lines of talking about China and where it's going from here, uh, there is something coming up this weekend that could potentially be ex exceptionally important, or maybe not, but it's the third plenum session of the Chinese Communist Party, which is the, uh, the third gathering of the new government administration under Xi Jinping. And basically every time there's a new premier, they have uh, these meetings, and the third plenum has become um, a, a one that people look to as a potential time at which the entire system will be changed. And you can go back to 1970. Eight, I believe, when uh, uh, the first real reforms, the opening up of the Chinese economy took place, perhaps it was 1976. Uh, 1993's third plenum was also a time in which uh, there was a drastic reformation, and we saw that the uh, number of state-run uh, companies declined from 10 million to under 300,000. So, um, so some major changes have come out of these gatherings in the past. We're on the cusp of another one, this time with the Xi Jinping government. Um, any thoughts on what this might mean and uh, where 
do you think China wants to go from here, um, especially in the face of their cooling off of their export economy and their attempts to stimulate some sort of domestic demand, even while they're having their own currency crisis and all of this uh, shenanigans going on? What, what do you see uh, eventuating from this weekend's meeting? Well, you know, the, these things are, are major events. You know, they're, they're, they're turning points in the, histor- in, in the history of a con- country whose industrial history lasts not barely 30 years. So one has to take it extremely seriously. Um, what it does reflect, of course, is, is that the, the incoming guy is trying to put his mark on, on things and he'll, he'll be um, putting his ideas on, on the table. You know, I, I know they're talking about social security, they're talking about land reforms, they're talking about uh, uh, development of uh, you know, a more, more liberalized economy. But you know, what, what you should never forget is, is that China represents more than a quarter of the world's population, maybe even all, almost a third, and uh, it's a centrally planned economy. Is it? Oh, sorry, I stand corrected. <laughs> but um, you, you know, um, making a ship making a, a ship that big turn in any direction is is extremely difficult and, and very long term. I mean, I've seen it even in you know in multinational corporations where. You know, once a year you had to sleep your way through three-year plans um, and say yes, 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 where everyone says all the same things at the same time and anyone who stands out um, is uh, quietly told, uh, I'm not sure you're in the right place. <laughs> so no doubt they'll have a deal of that in China as well. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, all of it is pointing China in, in the direction of, of becoming uh, a, a more developed economy, a more open economy, and the openness is going to help them grow. And the, as you say, their turn, their, their issues, their export, their export um, markets are all in difficulties at the moment. So the best thing that they can do to solve the problem is to make their own internal market more efficient, which means radical reforms at uh, at, at every level. You know, in terms of land ownership or. Uh, you know, where most of it's under the control of the states at the at the moment. Uh, they're going the opposite way from America. America's doing everything to do what China does, and China's running away from what they've done that's wrong to try and copy what America used to be 20 years ago. So it, it, it's really, um, it, it's kind of comical. Uh, but but uh, I, I can only regard it as being, being very positive. And um, as, as I say, um, if, if you were an analyst looking as to where America is going to stand against China in the years to come, um, it, it is certainly going to continue its, its relative decline. But uh, it'll be a long time before China can overtake uh, America because it, the thing about America is the infrastructure for most things is, is, is there. You know, you've got, the, you've got the financial markets which are well developed. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them, it's just they're in the hands of corrupt people. If you could eliminate that corruption, America's uh, uh, competitiveness would be um, a million times ahead of what China can do in the next 10 or 20 years. And it doesn't necessarily hurt to be small. I mean, I, I live in a small country uh, like, like Switzerland, uh, where, where compared to most places around the world, everything works very well. And being small is not a disadvantage. So everyone is trumpeting this idea of, you know, China is going to be bigger than <clears throat> bigger than America in terms of economy in a few years' time. It's not really that that counts. You know, it's, size doesn't really help you. Um, you know, w- what, what helps survival is, is people who are very adaptable, not those who are very brilliant and not those who are very big. So if, if America manages to actually um, <clears throat> seize on that and recognize and put aside their, their arrogance and uh, their guns and start being... Uh, competing on on the level playing field again, then then the, the the huge lead that they have already could be rediscovered, and and uh, they'd have nothing to worry about. And all these newspaper articles twenty years from now will just laugh at and say, well, you know, China they did they did try, but they were never really in the race in the first place. Now if it, the other way to go is to say it is to continue the stupidity at the moment, and bit by bit China is going to edge up there and become more of a problem and more of a geopolitical threat, and that could end extremely badly. 
It's going to be extremely interesting to watch what the next few years bring at any rate, no matter what happens, especially as China is now on at the cusp of its 10-year plan to move a quarter of a billion people from its rural countryside into the new ghost cities that they're building. You can watch videos of the ghost cities online, just entire massive shopping complexes and main streets and skyscrapers that are virtually empty. It is just a bizarre phenomenon that's happening right now in China. So whatever happens, I'm sure it will be very interesting to watch. Watch. But unfortunately, as we know, the Chinese curse goes, uh, may you live in interesting times. So, uh, well, here we are at any rate, so let's make the most of it. And uh, once again, just to bring it back to that meta level, uh, Henry Kissinger on the so-called right and George Soros on the so-called left agree completely that uh, China should be the model for the New World Order in Kissinger's world words, or the engine of the New World Order in Soros's words. So, there you go. Imagine that. The oligarchy isn't uh, isn't so different uh, along the left-right spectrum, after all. Okay. Well, uh, we've covered such an incredible amount in this conversation. Um, I'm not sure if there's a nice point to wrap it up on, but perhaps this is it, unless there's anything you'd like to add for t- to, today's, to today's conversation. No We've had a good run today, a very interesting conversation, very varied, and, uh, you know, thanks for um, promoting my, my new um, life as a, an active interviewing blogger. Well, as I say, I am always happy to see new people getting into it, so I'm going to be keeping my eye on it, and, uh, and good luck with that. So I will, uh, I'm not even subscribed to your YouTube channel yet, David. I'll have to do that <laughs> as soon as we finish. At any rate, uh, that'll do it for this, week, this month's conversation. I'm looking forward to talking to you again next month. Thank you again for your time. David L. Smith, GenevaBusinessInsider.blogspot.com. Thank you very much, James. Uh, see you next month.